apostle is writing and he says Colossians chapter 2 verse 12 and when you were baptized he's speaking to people that were baptized we've got a bunch of folk this morning that are going to get baptized when they when you were baptized it was the same as being buried with Christ buried with Christ then you were raised to life because of you had faith in the power of God who raised Christ from the dead verse 13 says you were dead because you were sinful and were not God's people But God let Christ make you alive when he forgave your sins. Wow! I, I want to show you some pictures this morning. Um, and that first picture that's coming up over there, do any of you gentlemen recognize anything like that? The next picture, the most expensive shoes in the world. How much? Are you going to pay for those pair of shoes? I need some helpers over here. Come on. Uh, please, we're not talking South African rand. We've got to talk in dollars over here. Come on, mention a figure to me. How much? A million. We've got a million rand. You're way off. Um, anybody else? Okay, for those... For those pair of shoes, ladies, um, you can see around the, you know, the ankle, those are diamonds over there. And to put those pair of shoes on, it's going to set you back about, I think it's 17 million dollars. 17 million dollars. Right. Let's... Let's, let me show you that, um, let me show you some more most expensive shoes in the world. Hit me neck. No, no, no. Go back. Go back. You, you've missed some shoes over there, brother. Right at the beginning, before these lot. They would. No. Okay. Right. There was that pair of shoes. Eh? Um. How much would you pay for those pair of shoes? 50 bucks. 50 bucks. <laughs> you would get a, somebody that made them would be very upset with you. Eh? Um, those pair of shoes will cost you, hit it, enter, 15 million dollars. Not rand, dollars. Okay, now there was a pair of shoes before that, um, Ray. Help me. No? Uh, okay, go on. Next one. There was another picture over there, Ray. 15 million. There, that way, pair of shoes. That pair of shoes. Ladies. It's amazing that all these are ladies' shoes, eh? Okay, how much are you going to pay for these shoes? Come on, let's get some... Uh, 45 what? $45 million. Okay, you're a little bit over the top there, you know. But still, I think more than what you would think over here. Come on, give me some more. $25 million. You're very close there, Brew. <laughs> very close. The most expensive shoes that you would ever be able to put according to the internet, Google, putting on those pair of shoes will cost you 
20 million dollars. All right. Now, Ray, get me down to those pair of gold shoes over there that were over there. Uh, those, those sneakers. Those are, you know, sneakers. Those are just normal, you know, shoes that we would wear. But what are you going to pay for those pair of sneakers? Help me. Obviously, we're going from shoes with diamonds and stinging and... Um, Five million dollars. Fifty million. No, 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 no. We're going a little bit over the hill over here now. One million. That's pretty close. You would pay two million dollars to put on those pair of shoes. And when we say gold, it's obviously not just the color. Right, now. Um, the next pair of shoes that we want to look at, I don't know what brand of shoes. These are Didas's over here. What? Mike? Uh, this is a Mike here. What's that? Nike. Oh, Nike. No, oh, sorry, man. Nike. What are you going to pay for these pair of Nike shoes? 50? No, you're quite close over there. We're talking in dollars over here now. For these pair of Nike sneakers, $65,000. $65,000. For those pair of Nike techies. You would never wear shoes like this, would you? Oh, well, I see some of you going like that. You would, first of all, never be able to afford them. And some of them, imagine, you know, just where are you going to go and wear them? Uh, are you going to wear them to church, you know, walk into church? Uh, are you going to go work in the garden with your pair of Nikes? Um, are you going to go on a hike with your pair of Nikes, you know, going up Table Mountain with your pair of Nikes on? Um, are, are you just going to, you know, go to a wedding with your pair of uh, um, lacquer 20 million shoes and it, when it comes to the dancing part of the, the wedding, just take them off quickly and slip them under the table and go dancing? Nay! You won't be able to do that. It's not the kind of shoes you would wear to a bride. It's the kind of shoes you would wear to a glamorous occasion. You want to make a statement of, wow, look at those shoes, you know. It's the kind of place where it's the, what do they call those little awards that um, they have with the movies? The Emmy Awards, what the? And, and so they got a red carpet over there and all those um, actresses come walking over there. <laughs> and um, it's that kind of place that you will wear shoes like this. Now, um, what am I doing in church this morning? <laughs> uh, talking about shoes. I want you to listen carefully and I want to make a statement to you this morning. Baptism is making a very expensive fashion statement. Baptism is making a very expensive fashion statement. It's a it's a public announcement. It's a public declaration of my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Why baptism? Verse 13 of Colossians says that we were dead. 
we were dead. Now we kind of understand some of the things of physical death. Death. When somebody dies, they stop breathing. There's no more chest moving. There's no air coming into the mouth. There's no nostrils. There's no air leaving. There is no more movement. If a dead person moves all on their own, get up and run away. They're not dead. They cease to move. They are history. They, they, whatever they did, you can only remember from the past, there's nothing new going to happen with them. Now that's physical death. So when the Bible talks to these people, these Colossians, and says to them, you were dead, it's not talking about physical death. It's talking about what we call spiritual death. Physical death is the separation of the soul from a body. They become separated. Spiritual death is of greater significance because it is the separation of the soul, that living part inside of you, from the living God. It's the separation from God. What does this spiritual death entail? What are some of the symptoms of it? We understand physical death. You know, okay, I'm not going to lie down now because I won't be able to get up. But, but um, you know what? There's no more breathing. But you know what? You can look at somebody and how are you going to tell that they are spiritually dead? What symptoms are you going to see? How are you going to know it? Well, the Bible talks about over there in verse 13, you were not God's people. And that's something you can't see. But you know what? It means that there is no relationship with God. When I meet these kind of people, they talk like this. The creator of the world. Well, so that's great. They talk about the man upstairs. They can say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them as we against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for you. Amen. Okay, let's carry on now. And so they can do all these things but there is no relationship with God. Help me, Ray. There is no relationship with God. There is no spiritual understanding. Point number two. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9, it says over there, and Isaiah writes to the people, he said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be ever seeing. In other words, hey, I see, but never perceiving what you are seeing. Make the heart of these people callous. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Yeah, Isaiah is describing people that they could see, they could hear, but they couldn't hear and see and understand the things of God. There is no grasp of spiritual understanding. Point number three. Symptom number three. A lack of spiritual desire. A person that is dead spiritually has no spiritual desire to do the will of God. God's will? It's my way or it's the 
highway. And you know what Frank Sinatra describes, what I believe very well. I did it my way. And we love it. The oak does it his way. And there's no thought. God, what is your way of doing things? What is your way of doing things? life what's your way what do you think god today i'm i'm facing all these challenges at work in you know driving to work and and this god what do you think about it no it's my way or the highway there is no spiritual strength symptom number three number four Hey, great, you folk are awake. Help me to get awake. There is no spiritual strength. Challenges of the power of sin leave spiritually dead people helpless and powerless. Somebody says something wrong. This happens. This goes wrong. And the next minute, the sin of Hatred creeps into the heart and there's no check. There's nothing. It just takes over and you know what? It's not long and the hatred gets worse and worse. Unforgiveness. Forgiveness? What's that? There is only one thing that needs to happen is revenge and the animosity just takes over and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and we get more agitated and angry. And there is no check. There is nothing to stop it. In actual fact, it becomes like a spiral. You enter into a spiral and you start spinning and you just start spinning faster and faster and it starts taking you down and down. And there is nothing to stop it. Because sin has gripped the heart, the emotions. There is nothing to stop it. And there is no control at all. Symptom number five. A person that is spiritually dead has no capacity to enjoy God. Well, you know what? The song might be lack of the music, and, but really, coming to that place where we can just be quiet, where we can praise God, where we can be quiet and just say, God, I love you. We can't do that. In actual fact, it's a waste of time. When it comes to serving God, well, that's not what we want to do. But sometimes, just to appease our conscience, we have to do it. We have to serve God. But it's not something that we do just from the heart and it's natural when you're spiritually dead you're unable to enjoy God you are unable to enjoy the things of God why baptism well the answer to that is pretty straightforward dead People need to get buried. Dead people need to get buried. You do not just leave dead people lying around. You bury them. And here the Bible says in verse 12, Paul writes to these Colossians and he says, in hindsight, Colossians, you guys, in your baptism, you bunch of guys that were dead, you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Do you remember you were baptized? And that was like a watery grave. It was buried behind this wall over here. Okay, there still is water there, Pierre. 
There is a whole bunch of water. That water represents a grave. And so when you, t you walk into that water, they take you and they just take the water and they pour it on you. No. They take you and they dip you. They bury you. And this signifies the burial of Jesus. Now, you were buried with Christ. And, but the good news is, Christ was buried. Is that correct? On a Friday, He died. On a Friday, He was buried. But then on the third day, on a Sunday morning, Jesus arose from the dead and he lives forevermore. Now, whew, what is so wonderful is, I, Paul writing over here, he says, guys, Jesus was buried. I identify with his burial. A dead person must be buried. But then he says, you, you, you rise up. Christ arose from the dead. And when you come out of that burial, you are resurrected to a new life. You might say to me, it's the same person that goes in over there. They look the same. Okay, that's a little nut. No. But, but you know what? There is something that has changed. That person was dead. But now they have been made Christ alive. What are the symptoms of somebody that has been made Christ alive? What are the symptoms that God makes somebody alive? They sit in church and they go to sleep. Well, they just carry on living like they did before. No, sir. When you got resurrection life inside of you, when you have God's life inside of you, some things change automatically. Number one, you start enjoying God. You start enjoying a relationship with God. When you get into your car in the morning, Jesus goes with you. When you wake up in the morning, you can come to your heavenly Father and you can speak to Him about all your problems. You can speak to Him and give Him thanks for His goodness and His mercy. And it's not something that you have to do, but you are with Him now. Something has changed. And it's not him, it's you. And you know what? He looks at you now. And he looks at you in a total different way because now you are in a relationship with him and you are in a relationship with him. You know what? Death, to many, we call it loss. And yes, it is a loss. But you know what the Apostle Paul said about death? Death is a gain. It is being present with the Lord forever. In Philippians 1 verse 21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In other words, I have a relationship with God. But man, the day I die, I enter into His presence. I see Him face to face. I know Him now. I know Him in heaven one day. When you become alive in Christ, you have spiritual strength. His love floods your heart. It's His forgiveness that floods you. Your sins are forgiven, the Bible says. And you are able to walk in forgiveness. God has forgiven 
you. You are able to have the strength of his hope. When you are looking around at this world, what is going on in the politics, what is going on in the finances, what's going on in your home, it is so easy to lose hope. But I want to say to you this morning, when Jesus arose from the dead, he put hope into your heart. And that hope gives you strength from day to day. When you are alive, it is his peace that you need. You listen to, then they go, okay, now, okay, we're going to go to Yugoslavia now and, and um, to the Ukraine, and we're going to try and get the, what do they call that place where they make the electricity, the, the power station, the atomic power station. And, and we're going to put some people there and try and protect it. And Because, man, if that thing goes up, there is big trouble. And we're going to try and make peace and this and that. And we read the newspaper. <laughs> I want to tell you, in, Jesus said, in this world you will not have peace. But in Him you will have peace. Because He is the Prince of Peace. Peace. And when you know him, you will know peace in the time of trouble, in the time of war. When you know Jesus Christ and you are alive in him, the Bible says the joy of the Lord will be your strength. God puts a joy in your heart. They can go make movies and they can make comedies and you can laugh along with them. But when the comedy is over, the laughter stops. But with knowing Jesus Christ, there is joy inside. There is aliveness. Man, this is the day that you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I don't have to sing it to be joyful. I am joyful and I sing it. Amen. When you are alive, you have God's strength. When none, number three symptom, when you're alive, you have the desire to do life His way, not your way. You want to learn His way of doing life. Point number four, symptom number four. There's the power of healing. My God that I serve is a God that heals. And when you become alive in Him, He comes along and He heals emotions. He takes away anger and He replaces it with His forgiveness and His love. Bitterness cannot stand in his presence. Hurt and pains that we have are gone. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, he was bruised for our sins. You know what it's like to be bruised by a fist? But what about the bruises yeah, inside of a heart? What about the bruises inside of a soul that you cannot see? When you are alive, God comes by His Holy Spirit and He brings healing. He comes and brings healing in relationships. People that you would never ever forgive, you start forgiving. Selfishness takes a back seat. You cannot be alive to God and continue to be selfish. You will want to give Symptom number five. And this is to me one of the most important ones. The day you become alive in Christ, you become a child of God. All of you saw Kelvin pick up his daughter over here now and walk out. Can you imagine how he feels about that little girl? You see the other prams over here. There are grandmothers sitting over here. They can um, do anything to your husband, but don't just don't touch my grandchild, eh? <laughs> the
There, there are some grandparents sitting over here. You were so hard on your children, but now that grandchildren are here. Ach, sis, toch, it's fine. And now you still want to bash your children for being nasty. To, like, how can you give them a hiding? And you as a grandparent know how you feel about your grandchildren. God's got no grandchildren, but He's got children. To as many as received Him, to them gave me the power to become children of God. I am a child of God. He's not the man upstairs. He's not just a father. He is my heavenly father. And I stand in a relationship to him. I showed you a bunch of shoes at the beginning. I hope they're all out of your mind now. Don't even think about it. And I said to you, baptism is making a very expensive, fashioned statement. I said to you, baptism is making a very expensive, fashion statement. What's so expensive about baptism? Is it the, is it the, you know, ach, it costs 20 million dollars to fill it up with water. Is it the water? Oh, it's Eskom's electricity. I understand that. Um, is it? Oh, now there's, why are all these people in this church? And now I've got to come and stand over here. And, uh, and I've got to do it in front of all these people over here. God, can't I just do it alone? You know, my ego. The answer is no. It's got nothing to do with that. It's expensive. Because you being made alive, having your sin forgiven, cost Jesus his life. Baptism, I'm a identifying with one of the most costly, the most beautiful things that ever happened in this world. Jesus coming and dying. Giving his life for me. What's the fashion? The fashion is baptism is wearing his death and his resurrection. Putting my faith and trust in his death and his resurrection. And because he died, he rose again. I died, I will live. It's a fashion statement that I'm making. I'm doing it in front of everybody sitting over here, my family, my friends, the people that know me, and God knows you even better than they do. I'm identifying with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I want to say to you this morning, God wants you to be alive. God wants you to be alive. God wants you to be alive to His blessings over your life. When you were knit together in your mother's womb, when you were still being formed in your mother's womb, God knew about you. His eyes were on you. He saw your unformed body and His thoughts towards you was His blessing was his fatherliness towards you. And he wants to bless you. He wants you to know his blessing. 
He wants you to be alive to His possibilities. We look at all the impossibilities around us. It's impossible to get work. And how are we going to do this? And what are we going to do that? But with God, all things are possible. I want to tell you, there are some people sitting over here today. You look down on yourself. But God wants to elevate you and bring you to a place where you will stand for Him and be counted for Him. Not in your own strength, but with His blessing and His anointing resting upon you. I don't care what the economy says. I don't care what everybody says around you. I don't care about your past. It's buried. And now I rise to new rise to new life. And it's the possibility of what God can do. I played golf, lousy golf, Jason, in Malmesbury. And traveling back, um, Alan and I were talking. And so I said to him, Alan, what's the most expensive shoes in the world? And obviously I done my homework. And so we started talking about this. And he said, man, if, if a pair of shoes like that had to ever come into his possession, he said to me, Paul, the first thing I will do is go and sell those shoes. <laughs> I will go and sell those shoes and I will go on pension. <laughs> and I will live and I'll have this and I'll have that. And you know what, man, just can you think what $20 million could buy you? And when he said that, you know what I think some people have done? They've gone along. And they've taken the death of Jesus. They've taken his resurrection. And they try to sell it for a better life. What this world can give them. What this world can buy. They, 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 they said, you know, you know, we need a home on earth. Hey man, what about a home in heaven? You know how expensive that is? Don't be cheap and sort out homes. Oh, I've got to go buy a lack of car. Vroom, vroom, vroom. I've got to get a, a, a better pair of shoes. I'm going to get lack of clothes. Well, that's wonderful. But never ever exchange being clothed in baptism with his fashion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. There's nothing more expensive than that on this planet and it's offered to you for free to as many as would receive him to them gave he power to be the children of God the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. What kind of shoes are you wearing today? Barter. I don't even know what make this is. <laughs> it ain't Nike and it got no diamonds and it's not worth 20 million I can assure you. But you know what? Yeah, deep down inside, I've got a fashion. <laughs> I was 15 years old, Daniel, when my father baptized me. And I didn't quite understand it all then. But now, years later, I'm 60 now, so that's 20 years ago. <coughs> It's the most fantastic thing. I am God's fashion statement. I don't care what 
everybody else, whether they stay in Platte Kloof or they stay in Boetesig. I don't care what kind of banking account you've got. I've got expensive taste. His name is Jesus. And he loves me. And he loves you too. Can I ask you a question? Are you dead? Or are you alive? Has there been a come a time in your life where you've celebrated your fashion statement? 